Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. We are excited to be here taking part in DEF CON China 1.0. This talk is IPv666, Address of the Beast. I am Mark, and this is Chris. Hey, what's going on, everybody? My name is Christopher Grayson. I'm originally from Atlanta, Georgia. I went to the Georgia Institute of Technology a few times. I uh, was the head of the Georgia Tech Hacking Club. I've been the, he the head of the red team at Snapchat, and I'm presently a security engineer at Bird Rise. My name is Mark Newland, and I'm a hacker by uh, formal or lack of formal education. I have done a lot of work in the wireless security space using software-defined radio to do reverse engineering of wireless protocols, and I've done a lot of vulnerability research in wireless devices. At this point, I have discovered and published vulnerabilities in wireless devices affecting somewhere north of 25 vendors. In my spare time, I've done a handful of DARPA challenges, placing top three in multiple of them. I'm a former member of the red team at Snapchat, and I now work as a security engineer at Bird Rides. And so what are we going to be talking about today? And the short answer is the future. And if you didn't know this, Chris and I actually recently went to the future, and while we were there, we discovered that there were IPv6 connected devices as far as the eye could see. Everywhere. And so we decided that we would build an open source tool that you can use today to discover these IPv6 connected devices. And we've been working on this project for about a year and a half now, and in that time, we've made a lot of mistakes, learned a lot of lessons, and this talk is a story of how we went from where we started to where we are now and how we built this neat tool. And I want to point out that this is a pretty technical talk, and we're going to gloss over some of the granular technical specifics, and we're doing this for the sake of translation clarity and time, all the details still in the slides, and if there's anything that we didn't cover in super depth that you would like to learn more about, please find us after the talk, and we are happy to answer any questions. And I also want to point out that Chris and I are not network engineers, and we've been learning about IPv6 as we go. So it's possible that we've got something wrong. If this is the case, please correct us, because we are here to learn just as much as we are here to share our experiences. We're going to start with some background on IPv6 and our motivations for doing this research. We are then going to look at the difficulties of scanning the IPv6 address space. We are going to go over some techniques that we tried to discover these IPv6 addresses, some that work well, some that did not. We're going to look at the latest iterations to our scanning algorithm. We're going to then look at the latest iteration of the software where we have the ability now to persist scan results to the cloud so that we can have a crowdsourced global data set of IPv6 addresses. We're then going to look at some results from these latest scanning improvements, talk about the tool that we've released, IPv666, and then have our conclusion. So a bit of background on why we care about this work. So here we have a plot of the percentage of users connecting to Google over IPv6 over the last 10 years. So we have 2009 on the left, 2019 on the right. And we can see that a decade ago, there were almost no users connecting to Google over IPv6. This has grown over time, and now in 2019, it's approaching a third of users connecting to Google over IPv6. And this is just a single internet company, but it's representative of the fact that IPv6 is growing, and as security practitioners, it's something that we should be spending more time thinking about the security implications of. And we got specifically interested in IPv6 as a result of some research we conducted a couple years ago. We presented at DEF CON 25 with our friend Logan Lamb a number of vulnerabilities that we discovered in Comcast cable modems and set-top boxes. And one of the big takeaways from this project was that a lot of these severe vulnerabilities could only be exploited over IPv6, and to do so, you needed to know the IPv6 address of the target device. And to illustrate this, I'm going to talk about one of the more interesting vulnerabilities. So if you're a customer of Comcast, you have a Comcast cable modem, you have the administrative web user interface that you can access on the local network, and there's a separate administrative web UI that can only be accessed from Comcast via a specific IPv6 address from a specific Comcast network segment. And we also spent some time looking at the set-top boxes, and there's a service called Send2TV. If you're a Comcast customer, you go to this website, you put in a URL, you hit go, and it displays that website in a web browser on your TV. We discovered that the set-top boxes actually exist in the same protected network segment as the Comcast customer support agent. And this meant that we could take the IPv6 address of any target customer's modem, put it into this Send2TV tool, and actually load the administrative web UI of their modem on our TV, and then sign in with hard-coded credentials. So this meant that we could actually remotely administer any customer's modem as long as we knew their IPv6 address. And this was our first hint that knowledge of how to discover these IPv6 addresses could have some pretty interesting security implications. Yeah, so that was quite a fun project. Uh, 
all of our research for that project is available on uh, GitHub if you want to take a look. Uh, but so we, we do this, we have a lot of fun with it, and we start thinking, oh, you know what, maybe we should dig into IPv6 a little bit more. And so we, we kind of came away with a handful of different things that left us scratching our head thinking like, huh, this seems like it might be concerning as far as security, uh, as far as security goes. And so one thing is that IPv6 works out of the box without any explicit manual configuration. Uh, so in IPv4, you typically are relying upon DHCP servers to give you your IP address. You don't need that in IPv6 anymore. There's an improvement called SLAC, the Stateless Address Auto Configuration Protocol, where if you speak IPv6, or you, if you have the ability to speak IPv6 and your networking equipment can speak IPv6, then you can just provision yourself an IP address. Not only that, but all of your like devices and networking equipment both support and prefer it, assuming that it's modern equipment. So this is your phone, this is your laptop, and this is your gateway. Uh, so that means that, you know, A, hey, your addresses can be provisioned automatically, and B, if that is possible, your devices are going to prefer speaking over IPv6 wherever possible. Third, there's no such thing as private address space anymore in IPv6, for the most part. There's this thing called unique local addresses, uh, but whereas, like, you know, Right now, when you go home and you plug your laptop in or you connect to your Wi-Fi network, you typically get like a 10.star address, a 192.168.star address, uh, but you're on a private network, and that means that folks from the open internet can't start routing traffic to you without you opting in and doing a NAT punch through. That's going away now. Basically, we're going back to the world where we have to rely upon uh, firewall rules to prevent access to your devices. We kind of found out, you know, when we first started looking into this, Mark is sitting at home on his couch, I'm sitting at home on my couch, and he was able to ping my Chromecast that was on my network. That was kind of odd to us. So your IPv4 firewall rules also don't apply. So if you even thought, you know what, I know about IPv6, I'm going to check my firewall rules and make sure that I'm blocking all incoming traffic, and you do IP tables L, well it turns out that that has nothing to do with IPv6. There's actually a separate list of rules and a separate utility for managing them. It's IP6 tables. Otherwise, it looks entirely the same, but just because you have your IPv4 firewall configured to block everything, that has nothing to do with IPv6. Um, and, and so somebody with, uh, somebody that, like, coming from a red team background, uh, my entire kind of understanding of ICMP, the Internet Control Message Protocol, is that it is for ping scanning hosts. Uh, and so, you know, there's commonly people asking, oh, how do I block ping? How do I do this? How do I do that? And uh, one of the kind of pieces of knowledge that is, that is given away in this is, oh, it just, uh, you know, block all ICMP traffic. Well, it turns out that you can't really do that in IPv6. ICMPv6 is a critical protocol. If you block it, block it everywhere, you are not able to, uh, uh, to route traffic. So in IPv6, uh, the address resolution protocol has been turned into the neighbor discovery protocol, which is packaged into ICMPv6. Ergo, it is a critical protocol. And then lastly, uh, there's no more notion of broadcast in IPv6. Uh, in IPv4, there's broadcast, and there's this thing called multicast, which is basically I take a packet and I send it to an IP address that makes, it, that ma makes the networking equipment propagate it to a bunch of different endpoints, but it was largely unsupported and unimplemented and unused. IPv6 only has multicast, and if you are too spec with IPv6, then you support it out of the box. So we read all of these things, and we're like, huh, this seems like it might be concerning. We should totally go test this hypothesis that IPv6 security posture might be worse than IPv4, and then we ran right into the problem that the rest of this talk is going to be uh, covering. So as Chris mentioned, we want to validate our hypothesis that the IPv6 security stance is potentially worse than IPv4, and to do this, we need a number of IPv6 addresses to look at to see what these devices are actually doing. And we quickly run into this problem of scale. So with IPv4, we have a 32-bit address space, which gives us just shy of 4.3 billion addresses. And this is a lot of addresses, but you can nonetheless have a single computer do a TCP connect scan on one port across the entire IPv4 address space in an afternoon. With IPv6, we go up to a 128-bit address space, and this is a much, much larger number of addresses. So on the bottom of this slide is the total number of possible IPv6 addresses, and I have no idea how to even begin pronouncing this number. It has 13 commas. It is far more commas. addresses than we could ever possibly hope to scan, so we need to come up with creative ways to find these potential addresses to go and scan. And then we have something called PSLAC, which complicates this. 
So originally, there was a protocol called Slack, the stateless address auto configuration protocol, which is used to generate an IPv6 address. And we can think of an IPv6 address as having two components. We have the network bits, which are commonly the lower 64 bits of the address, and these represent the network that the device is connecting through. Then we have the host bits, which are commonly the upper 64 bits of the address, and these represent a unique identifier for that host. With the original version of Slack, the host bits were just a direct transform between the MAC address of the network interface to these host bits. And this transform would be the same regardless of what network you were on. So this meant that if you connected your computer to the internet over IPv6 at home, you would have the network bits from your home internet, and you would have the host bits that were related to your MAC address. You then went and connected from a coffee shop, or from work, or from somewhere else, and you would have a different address because you would have different network bits, but your host bits would be the same. And this meant that website operators could actually track you as you went to different locations and connected to their services because these host bits would be the same. So PSLAC, which is the privacy extensions for Slack, introduces pseudo-random entropy to the process of generating these host bits. And this is good for privacy because it means you can no longer be tracked as you connect to multiple locations, but it's bad for us because that high entropy means it's difficult for us to do any kind of probabilistic modeling to predict what these addresses are going to be. So this means we have to really break this down into two separate problems. We first have the problem of identifying the high entropy P slack addresses, and then we have the problem of identifying the lower entropy non P slack addresses. So in the case of the high entropy P slack addresses, we decided to get creative and see if we could use honeypotting techniques to instead of predicting what these addresses would be, to just get these devices to connect to us instead. And so we started by setting up a web server, a DNS server, and an SMTP server on a cloud instance that we spun up. We used a few techniques to get traffic to these uh, services, and the idea was we could start collecting this list of IPv6 addresses. So we started by setting up a Honeypot DNS server, which was just a bind server, and at this point, we thought we needed to be clever, and we assumed that we would have to funnel connections that were coming in on IPv4 over to IPv6. What we didn't realize at the time is that on modern operating systems, if a device can connect over IPv6, it will automatically prefer IPv6 in most cases. Yeah, turns out that all the documentation we read was correct. And so we ended up doing some extra work. We thought we were being clever, but it was just uh, extra work that didn't really net us anything. So here we have a plot of DNS requests over time to the service, and we can see we have a few spikes here. And these spikes correlate to campaigns we ran with an ad network called Pop Ads. And Pop Ads is an ad network where you give them money and they drive traffic to your website. And we selected Pop Ads because they were the cheapest ad network we could find. And so here we have a plot of some traffic from pop ads over a course of two minutes. And in this case, we gave them 10 or $15 and got between 40 and 50,000 requests in two minutes. And now you might think, how do you get 40 or 50,000 real users to click on your website in two minutes? We don't really know. Uh, we do know that the referring page for a lot of these requests was just a blank page with a crypto miner JavaScript payload. So it's you know, tough to say, but totally may legit. Yeah, maybe not 100% legitimate traffic. So then we set up a Honeypot web server, and this was initially running at IPv6.exposed, which is where our web portal is up now. And we were serving this over both IPv4 and IPv6. The idea was if the page was requested over IPv4, we would have images served over IPv6 so that we could get IPv6 addresses even from IPv4 clients. And again, this was a case where it was not necessary because everything just automatically connected over IPv6. And we also had a WebRTC JavaScript payload on this page, which would enumerate the private IPv4 addresses of the client, as well as our IPv6 addresses, and post those back to a web service we controlled. Now, one thing I want to note here, we tried posting links to this all over social media. Uh, it turns out we're really not yeah, that popular, and so popular. we didn't get any traffic from that. Uh, so this, again, was a case where we used pop ads to drive traffic to this. So here we have plots of the number of access log requests from the web server on the top over time, and then from the HTTP postbacks on the bottom. And this is over the course of around 10 months, and so again, we have these spikes where we did the pop ads campaigns. Now on the top, the access log requests are on the order of tens of thousands, but the postbacks are on the order of thousands. So this tells us that while we had a lot of requests to the web server, most of those clients weren't actually executing the JavaScript payload, and so it, again, limited the quality of data that we received. So then we tried to set up a Honeypot SMTP server, and we thought we were being really clever. We thought we would post email addresses to this all over the internet, we would sign up for spam lists, and our hope was that we would have a lot of DNS resolutions and a lot of SMTP hits uh, from these email addresses. And unfortunately, this was just a major bust. We had a, a small number of hits from infrastructure email providers like Hotmail and Yahoo, but nothing terribly interesting with the SMTP Honeypot. 
So what does this honeypot results look like? Over the course of 10 months, we generated around 90 or discovered around 92,000 unique IPv6 addresses. And in practicality, we ended up spending closer to $1,000. We, uh, we kind of lost focus on this because it was a slow process. It was expensive. The results weren't as promising as we wanted, but it was still a number of addresses that we discovered. So after we collected this set, we decided to do an ICMP ping scan and see how many of these hosts were still live. And much to our dismay, almost none of them were up. And this led us to the discovery of something called ephemeral IPv6 addresses. So just as we have ephemeral UDP and TCP ports, we have ephemeral IPv6 addresses. And in these cases, outgoing connections will have a unique ephemeral IPv6 address per connection. And so most of those 92,000 addresses that we discovered were actually not live and pretty pointless. So now we've spent you know, 10 months, $1,000, and have basically nothing to show for it. And so we decided to switch gears and start looking at some different techniques for predicting these lower entropy non p slack addresses. Yeah, and uh, it, it's the hallmark of a good research project when you spend a lot of money and a lot of time for absolutely no reason. That's how you know you're going in the right direction. So we talked about the p slack addresses. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about the ones that don't have a lot of entropy. So we started looking at these addresses. This is a sample of addresses from a bunch of public data sets. Um, and just kind of like squinting your eyes, it, you can see that there's some structure in them. Uh, and this was kind of our hypothesis was that, okay, like looking at these, you can see that there's a number of kind of byte boundaries that people are commonly iterating upon. You have like colon, colon one, colon, colon two. So clearly, clearly devices are getting least, uh, least IP addresses from DHCP servers. There must be a lot of structure in these. And so what does any self-respecting computer science professional do when posed with a problem with data? Blockchain? Machine learning, obviously. This is the solution to everything. Uh, so not only are we not network engineers, but we're not machine learning experts either. Uh, and so I'm going to basically we, we worked with a friend of ours that is a machine learning expert. And uh, he w told us that we should build an autoencoder. And so I'm going to explain this in, in the way that it was explained to me. Uh, so if you think about the way the human eye works, uh, light bounces around, it bounces off of objects, it goes through the lens of your eye and hits the retina on the back of your eye, and your brain interprets that as, uh, as your vision. So if your lens is damaged, then the, uh, the data that is processed on the back of your eye is imperfect. It might be blurry, it might be the wrong shape, uh, but the point being that when the lens is damaged, you have a, an imperfect image that goes through or on the other side. So the autoencoder is very similar in that you basically build this lens, and then when you push data through this lens, it changes the data. So it transforms the data a little bit. But the very interesting part about an autoencoder is the way in which it changes the data. And the error in the lens is actually representative of the structure of the data that the lens was built from. So the idea is we take all of, our, uh, all of the public addresses that we know about from public data sets, we build this autoencoder, and then we take the addresses, put it through it. The autoencoder changes those addresses in a way that is representative of the structure of the IPv6 addresses that we trained on, and then we have new addresses that we can scan. And of course, this worked completely well. Just kidding, this did not work at all. Uh, so we basically could only make a completely perfect lens so that we would take a data set and pass it through the lens and then the data that we got out the other side was the exact same as what we had passed in. So not particularly useful, uh, fairly discouraging. We'll throw this on the pile with the thousand dollars and the PSLAC stuff. Uh, but we're like, okay, we have to at least be on the right track here. And so then we found this paper, which was the Entropy IP paper. And this is from a group of uh, researchers at Akamai. And what they did is they looked at the address structure in about like on the order of billions of IPv6 addresses that were traversing the Akamai network. And the conclusion that they came to is basically there's, there's a lot of structure in these addresses. And so the graph that you see up here in the top left-hand corner, that's actually mapping entropy by bit of the IPv6 addresses that were analyzed. And so you see on the right-hand side, you have very high entropy. That makes sense. Those are, the, uh, those are the ranges that are like very commonly being iterated over. In the middle, you have very high entropy. So that's the slash 64 boundary. So you would expect there to be a lot of networks provision there. But everywhere else, there seems to be a fairly low amount of entropy. So you're like, okay, 
I feel like we're at least headed in the right direction. What can we do to solve this problem? And we do what we're really good at. <laughs> we got really dumb about it. So here's what we did. Because we, we, ba we basically just needed something, anything that works. We want to build the system that generates addresses, scans for them, takes addresses back, feeds them back in, and then continues in this loop. So we came up with this very simple scheme where we take an address and we break it down into the, its 32 constituent nibbles, a nibble being four bits. And then we count the occurrences of nibble pairs. So we say, OK, in position 0, when the current value is OX2, the next value that we see is OX8 one more time. OK, in position 1, when the current value is OX8, the next value is OX0 one more time. And we do this for every nibble of every IP address that we have in our data set. And we end up with a probability distribution on a per nibble basis for predicting what the next nibble will be based on the value of the current nibble. And with this, to actually predict an IP address, we would start with OX2. And we would say, OK, what's the pr what is the probability distribution for all of the nibbles after OX2 in position 0 that we've seen before? We would get all those probabilities. We would create a weighted die. And we would roll that die. And whatever comes up is what we would go with for the next value. So now we have a value for position 1. We would do it get the same for position 2, position 3, so on and so forth. And we get an IP address out of it. And so we do this. And uh, another, another word of warning, whenever you're doing research and the result seems too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. Uh, so we generate 10 million addresses in this way, and we do an ICMP scan across all of them, and 50,000 of them respond. We're just like, wow, we're really good at this. That <laughs> we're pretty good. I can't believe that worked. I, I, guess, we're just really, I guess we're just really good at this. Um, false. So this is when we learned about these things called alias networks and what an alias network range is. And, and to this day, we still don't know why these things exist. Uh, but it's where every single IP address in an IPv6 network range is mapped to a single host. So there might be 2 to the 96, 2 to the power of 96 hosts in an address range. And every single one of them will respond to an ICMP uh, ping scan. So when you have a probabilistic model and a feedback loop, that scans and then takes the live addresses and feeds them back in and then scans some more, you very quickly come up with a completely useless tool because it's just really good at finding these sorts of ranges because they have such a significant representation in the data set. So we had to figure out how to detect these alias network ranges. And so here's how we did that. So we, get, we take that address, it responded to a ping scan, and we say, OK, I'm going to wrap you in a slash 96 network. And then I'm going to generate eight addresses at random in that network. And then I'm going to ping scan all eight of those. So the idea being that, OK, we think that this address might be in an alias network range. We're going to take a network range around it, generate a bunch of random addresses in it, because if it is in an alias network range, then these are going to respond. And the likelihood that we guess four out of 4.5 billion live hosts at random is pretty small. So we ICMP scan, and if 50% of the addresses respond, we know that that slash 96 is an alias network range. But the network range might be bigger than a slash 96, so now we need to find the boundary of where that network range uh, ends. So we take this address, we map it to its bits, and we already know that the rightmost 32 bits are within the alias network range, and the other 96 bits we don't know. So we're going to do a binary search. We're going to take the right half of the bits that we don't know about and flip them. And then we're going to scan that. The idea being that, look, every single address in an alias network range is going to respond. So if all of those bits are in the alias network range, then this address will respond too. So one of two things happens then. Either we don't get a response, and in that case, the, uh, the left bits that we didn't test are not in the network range, and the boundary exists within the, within the bits that we did flip. And in the case where we get a response, it's the opposite. So the bits that we flipped are clearly within the alias network range, and then the bits to the left of it are the ones that we don't know about. And then we rinse and repeat. 
we do this five or six times and you actually find the exact barrier or boundary for where the alias network range ends. And then we blacklist that network range and remove any addresses that are in our data set uh, that, are, uh, that are from it. And so that is where our first kind of iteration on this project ended. Uh, so we would generate these addresses, scan for them, and then the ones that, c that responded saying, hey, I'm live, we would do this alias network detection, remove the ones that were in alias networks, take the results, put them back in the model, and keep going. And it worked reasonably well. Uh, so we could find one new novel IPv6 address that we hadn't seen before once every 15 seconds, so for a minute. Not great, but at the same time, that's better than guessing out of two to the power of 128. So this is actually the fourth time that we've spoken on this topic, and we don't like giving the same talk twice. Uh, so every time we give a talk, we, we add a little bit more to it, we improve it a little bit, and one of the more recent updates that we did was about getting less dumber. Hard for us to do, but we try. And we wanted to focus on having a better address discovery rate. And when we're looking around, we found this paper called 6Gen, which is made by these folks at UC Berkeley. And uh, it's basically a further iteration of the Entropy IP paper, really interesting stuff. But the coolest thing that, or basically the thing that really resonated with us was their notion of an IPv6 address cluster. So in our previous probabilistic model, we only could have causality between two adjacent nibbles, right? Because we're only checking to see what is the probability distribution of the next nibble every time that we're looking at it. But it turns out that there is, there's basically more causality between nibbles that aren't adjacent. They can be on like almost completely other sides of, uh, of the address. So these guys define an IPv6 address cluster as an IP address and a set of wildcard nibble indices. And I'll explain more about what that means in a second. Uh, when they're evaluating how good a cluster is, they consider two things, one of which is the capacity, that's how many possible IPv6 addresses are there in this cluster, and then density, which is of all of those IPv6 addresses, how many of them are in your input data set. So let's walk through what one of these clusters looks like. So we have the same address from before, and we say, okay, we're gonna create a cluster of size one with no wildcard indices, and that's it. And it's fairly uninteresting because it's just a cluster of size one. It can only have one address in it. Uh, but where it gets interesting is when we say, okay, you know what? I want to upgrade this cluster to contain this other IP address. So when we're upgrading a cluster to contain another IP address, we break down both IP addresses, the one that the cluster is based off of and the one we want to add, and we say which nibbles are the same and which ones are different. And in this example, there's only one nibble that is different. It's right there uh, in, in the first, first index. And so we say, okay, in order to, to upgrade this cluster so that it contains both of these addresses, we have to add a wildcard index in that position because the wildcard matches any nibble. The rest of the nibbles are the same, so now this is the cluster that we would have if we upgrade it to contain both. And in this case, because there's only one wildcard index and there's, four, uh, there's 16 possible values for a nibble, the capacity here is 16. There's 16 possible IP addresses in it. There's only two data points that we use to feed into it. Our data set is of size two, which gives us a density of 12.5%. And just to drive this home, this is all of the IP addresses that exist within that cluster. So the original algorithm, I'm gonna skip over a bit, uh, but another, another note on research projects. If you're ever reading a paper, and the paper has one section that says algorithm, and then the next section says optimizations for how you can get this algorithm to run on your computer, it's probably an expensive algorithm, it's probably not gonna work in your tool all that well, this is that case. One thing to note, this is quite expensive, but we had, basically, we based our work on this. So without this work, without what they put together, we would not be standing here in front of you able to say that we accomplished what we did. So here's the idea behind how we use these clusters. We take our initial data set, and for every IP address in our data set, we create a cluster of size one. So we have as many clusters as, uh, as IP addresses when we start. And then for every single one of those clusters, we were asking the question, hey, 
what would the best wildcard index to add to this cluster be? So we say, okay, for this cluster, what if I put a wildcard index at index zero? How good would that cluster be? What's its density? Okay, how about index one? How about index two? How about index three? So we end up with, for every cluster that we start with, here are the here's the best upgrades for every single one of them. And then in some cases, there's no good upgrades. And that kind of means that this IP address is just hanging out there in the ether without any really adjacent neighbors. There's nothing near it. And we take those clusters that have no adjacent neighbors and we just put them to the side. So with those to the side, we have our set of clusters, we have our set of potential upgrades. We sort the upgrades by density. We want to take the best upgrades first and then we take the upgrade off the top, put it into our cluster set and then recalculate what its next best upgrade would be and put it back on the list of upgrade candidates. So we take one off the top, figure out what its next step would be, put it back on the list of potential upgrades, rinse and repeat. And we do this until the score, we have a scoring system for our cluster set. And basically we, we recalculate the score every time that we bring a new candidate over into the cluster set. And what we see is when we start, the score goes up, 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 and then it hits a peak, and then it starts coming down. We want to find the model when it's at that peak. So we just watch the score, and once the score starts decreasing, we say this is the best possible cluster set that we can build, and we're good to go. We end up with a list of clusters that describe our data set with hopefully high density. And the green here shows that it's a better algorithm than the previous one. <laughs> so once we have that data, how do we turn that into IP addresses? Well, if we want to generate an IP address, we take a cluster at random from our data set, and then for every one of the 32 nibbles, we flip a coin. If the coin comes up heads, we generate from the cluster. If the coin comes up tails, we generate from a probability distribution built from all of the addresses that we did not include in our cluster. Those ones that we put to the side and we said, these don't really have any neighbors. So in the case we were generating from the cluster, it's fairly simple. If the nibble at this index is a wildcard index, then we just pick a random nibble, equally weighted. If it's not a wildcard index, then it's the value of the IP address at that nibble from that cluster. And if we generate from all the addresses that aren't in our cluster model, then it's just a probability distribution of what are the values of the nibble in this position that we've seen in all the rest of the data. And so that's how we make better progress on generating the candidate addresses that we want to scan. And now Mark's going to talk a bit about how we improve upon kind of fanning out from them. So as Chris mentioned, with the improved 666 gen algorithm, we were able to improve our scanning coverage and generate a good set of addresses that we couldn't with the initial probabilistic model. And now we want to use these newly discovered addresses as landing points and fan out from there. And what we mean by that is once we've discovered a new address, we can assume that there are potentially other addresses that might be live that follow a similar structure to that address. And we can also look for neighboring networks and neighboring hosts depending on the specific addresses we found. So for the nibble adjacent fan out, which is how we look for addresses with similar structure but different addresses, we change one nibble at a time, so four bits at a time for the discovered address. So in this example, we have a target network of 2000 slash 4. The slash 4 tells us that the first nibble, the first four bits, is fixed. So the 2 is always going to be the same. And then for the other 15 nibbles, we generate 15 addresses each with the 15 values that are not present in this address. So what that looks like is we take the last nibble. In this case, it starts with a value of 1. So we generate an address with that nibble as a value of 0, and then a value of 2, 3, and so forth, until we've generated 15 new IPv6 addresses from that initial address by burying that one nibble. And we go down and we do this for each of the 31 nibbles that are not fixed in that target network. And in this case, we have 31 nibbles, 15 new addresses each. We've generated 465 new candidate addresses from that one input address. And we like to do this because scanning is very, very cheap. It's very inexpensive computationally to scan addresses, and generation is the hard part. So once we've found an address, we want to say, okay, are there other addresses that are similar to this but have basically the same structure? Then we also do a sequential fan out looking for both neighboring networks and neighboring hosts. And one of our observations is that networking equipment, especially consumer premises equipment like cable and DSL modems, will frequently be assigned an IP address of a slash 64 colon colon 1. And so you'll have a router which has a slash 64 and the first address 
in the right 64 bits is the router address. So when we find one of these colon colon ones, we then look for incrementing and decrementing neighboring slash 64 networks. So we take those lower 64 bits and we count up and we count down monotonically. And the idea here is that if I'm an ISP and I'm allocating addresses to my customers, I am likely to do this kind of sequential address assignment. And then we do something similar for neighboring hosts. So we have a colon colon one address on a slash 64. This is common to see in a modem, which will then assign DHCP leases to clients, monotonically increasing from there. So when we see the colon colon one, we then generate the list of addresses of colon colon two, three, four, and so forth. And this allows us to find potentially neighboring addresses from this initial input set. And with this, we've been able to really answer this question of is us any smarter, have we gotten any less dumber, and how much have we actually improved our scanning algorithm? And it turns out that combining the 666 gen generation with the fanning out is worlds better than our previous implementation. So with version 0 0.2, which our first real good attempt, we were pretty happy with this. We were finding around 60,000 addresses over the course of eight days. These were 80% of them were distinct, not in previously seen public data sets, and this was pretty cool. But then we got this version 0 0.3 rolled out, and this was a huge improvement. So now we're able to find, in this case, 1.57 million addresses in the course of an hour. 78% of them were not in the previous public data sets. This is a 503,000% improvement over v0.2. And so we're pretty happy with these results. And so we decided to take a sample set of 100,000 addresses from this discovered list, and we did TCP connect scans on a number of common ports. And the objective here was to see, are these live hosts, is there you know, some false positive situation going on? And we had a lot of open TCP ports, which tells us that these were in fact live hosts. We've seen lots of networking equipment, both infrastructure and consumer premises, lots of no-auth MongoDB instances, ancient SSH, ancient Telnet. And so this tells us that we're getting closer to being able to look at this hypothesis we started with, that the IPv6 world is potentially more security risky than IPv4. And you know we've been working on this project for a year and a half, and we, we started with this one objective in mind, and it's taken us a year and a half to get to the point where we can actually start the original research that we wanted to do. So it's pretty exciting that we're at this point now, and we're looking forward to continuing this work. And now Chris is going to take you to the cloud. To the cloud, up and away. So as I said before, this is the fourth time that we're speaking on this topic. We don't like to give the same talk twice. Um, and every time we talk, we put something new into the code base. So last time, last iteration, we made a much better kind of like scanning algorithm and scanning process. And it was pretty cool. Like we like previously, it's like, oh, cool. We found 50,000 addresses. And then we're watching this run. When it was like, how, how, it, it just found 150,000 in like five minutes. That's amazing. And so uh, we did a little bit more analysis, and it looks as though this can scale out horizontally pretty well. So we can run two instances of it, and they will find fairly unique and independent addresses from one another. And so that puts us in an interesting situation where this is really good data to enable folks to kind of like get the data on their own and then potentially aggregate it with us. And so we put functionality into the tool where uh, when you run it the first time, it prompts you and says, are you OK sharing the IP addresses that you find? And if you say yes, it just uploads the addresses as you find them, uh, and it puts them on our web portal, which the link is not up there right now, but it was up there before. Uh, it's ipv6.exposed. Uh, and so the whole point here is to basically aggregate this data set across anyone who is comfortable running it and sharing data with us and then enable users of this web portal to query the data so they don't even have to run the tool on their own to kind of make use of the data that, uh, that we're collecting. So if this sounds interesting to you, please take a look at our tool, try running it, take a look at our data set. Uh, we'd love to see what you think. And so uh, kind of to close things out for me, this is where you can get our tool. Uh, if you have Golang 1.11 or higher installed, just do go git and then that GitHub, uh, that GitHub URL. Uh, my handle is LavaLamp. I'm not fast enough to get just LavaLamp as my username anywhere, so I put a dash after it in my GitHub account. You can find it there. Uh, also, if you feel like contributing, we'd love, we'd love uh, more contributors uh, and hopefully, hopefully you guys like it. There's a handful of slides here talking about the various utilities. You can, so you can discover new addresses. You can scan to see if a network is aliased. You can generate addresses with the model that we have. You can take a set of input data and generate your own model. You can generate a blacklist. 
You can clean a list based on the, based on the blacklist uh, that, that's packaged with the tool, and then you can convert the file to various uh, IPv6 file formats. Uh, this is a personal blog, again, a link to the tool, and Mark's gonna bring things home. So we started by talking about the reasons we got into this project as an offshoot of our Comcast research and interest in IPv6. We looked at how it's really difficult to actually scan the IPv6 address space due to this huge number of addresses. We talked about our very, very failed attempts at doing honeypotting, our slightly improved attempts at doing probabilistic modeling, and then our big improvements with the 666 gen algorithm. We looked at our results where we can do 10 million new rediscovered addresses in a 24-hour period. We talked about our cloud persistence service where we can actually crowdsource this data set of global IPv6 addresses. We looked at our tool, IPv666, which is available for you to use, and we encourage you to do so. And I just want to say that you know we've been working on this project for a year and a half, and we've gone through a lot of failures, we've learned a lot of lessons, and we hope that you're able to use the fruits of our effort and contribute this to your own research, and we're happy to be here at DEF CON China 1.0 giving back to the community. These are some links of papers and projects that have inspired us. We recommend you take a look if you're interested in this space. And now we have just a few minutes for Q&A. Shishu. Cool, well, if there are no questions, um, if you see us, please stop us and talk to us. We're gonna be around the con most of the day. And uh, yes, thank you all. Thank you.